Hello everyone, it's Saoirse. Merry Christmas! I'm gonna say that a few times this month because I'm really going hard on the Christmas content. It is my favorite time of the year. And I really liked doing that cozy book video and it got me thinking about the Christmas scenes in books. And I thought that would be a really fun thing to sit down and read. Just the Christmas scenes from some books that I like and it turns out they're mostly classic books, a couple of modern classics. Um, and I'm very excited about this. It's going to be some of the passages are just like a paragraph and some are a few pages. So I'll put little chapters in so you can skip through the video if you don't want to watch a certain book. We're going to start off with Anne of Green Gables. Yes, I'm still going to do a video on this. And this is just such a cozy book to begin with. It, you know, it needs a Christmas scene, and luckily it has one. Um, you might notice some of these books are the same ones from the cozy video. Isn't it funny how that works? Like, I just felt a cozy vibe from them, and I didn't even always remember that there was a Christmas scene. All right, Anne of Green Gables. Christmas morning broke on a beautiful white world. It had been a very mild December and people had looked forward to a green Christmas, but just enough snow fell softly in the night to transfigure Avonlea. Anne peeped out from her frosted gable window with delighted eyes. The firs in the haunted wood were all feathery and wonderful. The birches and wild cherry trees were outlined in pearl. The plowed fields were stretches of snowy dimples, and there was a crisp tang in the air that was glorious. Anne ran downstairs singing until her voice re-echoed through green gables. Merry Christmas, Marilla. Merry Christmas, Matthew. Isn't it a lovely Christmas? I'm so glad it's white. Any other kind of Christmas doesn't seem real, does it? I don't like green Christmases. They're not green. They're just nasty faded browns and grays. What makes people call them green? Why, why, Matthew, is that for me? Oh, Matthew! Matthew had sheepishly unfolded the dress from its paper swathings and held it out with a deprecatory glance at Marilla, who feigned to be contemptuously filling the teapot but nevertheless watched the scene out of the corner of her eye with a rather interested air. Anne took the dress and looked at it in reverent silence. Oh, how pretty it was. A lovely, soft brown Gloria with all the gloss of silk, a skirt with dainty frills and shirrings, a waist elaborately pin-tucked in the most fashionable way, with a little ruffle of filmy lace at the neck. But the sleeves, they were the crowning glory. Long elbow cuffs, and above them two beautiful puffs divided by rows of shirring and bows of brown silk ribbon. That's a Christmas present for you, Anne, said Matthew shyly. Why, why, Anne, don't you like it? Well now, well now, for Anne's eyes had suddenly filled with tears. Like it? Oh, Matthew! Anne laid the dress over a chair and clasped her hands. Matthew, it's perfectly exquisite. Oh, I can never thank you enough. Look at those sleeves. Oh, it seems to me this must be a happy dream. Well, well, let us have breakfast, interrupted Marilla. I must say, Anne, I don't think you needed the dress, but since Matthew has got it for you, see that you take good care of it. There's a hair ribbon Mrs. Lynde left for you. It's brown to match the dress. Come now, sit in. I don't see how I'm going to eat breakfast, said Anne rapturously. Breakfast seems so commonplace at such an exciting moment. I'd rather feast my eyes on that dress. I'm so glad that puffed sleeves are still fashionable. It did seem to me that I'd never get over it if they went out before I had a dress with them. I'd never have felt quite satisfied, you see. It was lovely of Mrs. Lynde to give me the ribbon, too. I feel that I ought to be a very good girl indeed. It's at times like this I'm sorry I'm not a model little girl, and I always resolve that I will be in future. But somehow it's hard to carry out your resolutions when irresistible temptations come. Still, I really will make an extra effort after this. When the commonplace breakfast was over, Diana appeared, crossing the white log bridge in the hollow, a gay little figure in crimson ulster. Anne flew down the slope to meet her. Merry Christmas, Diana, and oh, it's a wonderful Christmas. I have something splendid to show you. Matthew has given me the loveliest dress with such sleeves. I couldn't even imagine any nicer. I've got something more for you, said Diana breathlessly. Here, this box. Aunt Josephine sent out a big box with ever so many things in it, and this is for you. I'd have brought it over last night, but it didn't come until after dark, and I never feel very comfortable coming through the haunted wood in the dark now. Anne opened the box and peeped in. First a card with For the Anne Girl and Merry Christmas written on it, and then a pair of the daintiest little kid slippers with beaded toes and satin bows and glistening buckles. Oh, said Anne, Diana, this is too much. I must be dreaming. 
I call it providential, said Diana. You won't have to borrow Ruby's slippers now. And that's a blessing, for they're two sizes too big for you, and it would be awful to hear a fairy shuffling. Josie Pye would be delighted. Mind you, Rob Wright went home with Gertie Pye from the practice night before last. Did you ever hear any anything equal to that? All the Avonlea scholars were in a fever of excitement that day, for the hall had to be decorated, and a last grand rehearsal held. The concert came off in the evening and was a pronounced success. The little hall was crowded, all the performers did excellently well, but Anne was the bright particular star of the occasion, as even envy in the shape of Josie Pye dared not deny. Oh, hasn't it been a brilliant evening, sighed Anne, when it was all over and she and Diana were walking home together under a dark, starry sky. I'm going to stop there. So beautiful. Um, that book and the show Anne with an E has brought me a lot of comfort. I definitely recommend both of those things. I'm going to go close the back door because somebody's dog keeps barking. And it's so nice out, actually, today that I've had the door open. Excuse me. Okay, we're gonna take the vibes down a little bit with Wuthering Heights. Not a very happy book, um, but we do have a Christmas scene that's a few pages, and we're trying to get a view of Christmas across a lot of different books, not just the very joyful ones. Kathy stayed at Thrushcross Grange five weeks, till Christmas. By that time, her ankle was thoroughly cured and her manners much improved. The mistress visited her often, in the interval, and commenced her plan of reform by trying to raise her self-respect with fine clothes and flattery, which she took readily, so that instead of a wild, hatless little savage jumping onto the house, jumping into the house and rushing to squeeze us all breathless, there lighted from a handsome black pony, a very dignified person with brown ringlets falling from the cover of a feathered beaver, and a long cloth habit, which she was obliged to hold up with both hands that she might sail in. Indley lifted her from her horse, exclaiming delightedly, Why, Cathy, you are quite a beauty. I should scarcely have known you. You look like a lady now. Isabella Linton is not to be compared with her, is she, Francis? Isabella has not her natural advantages, replied his wife. But she must mind and not grow wild again here. Ellen, help Miss Catherine off with her things. Stay, dear, you will disarrange your curls. Let me untie your hat. I removed the habit, and there shone forth beneath a grand plaid silk frock, white trousers, and burnished shoes, and while her eyes sparkled joyfully when the dogs came bounding up to welcome her, she dare hardly touch them, lest, lest they should fawn upon her splendid garments. She kissed me gently. I was all flour making the Christmas cake, and it would not have done to give me a hug. And then she looked round for Heathcliff. Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw watched anxiously their meeting, thinking it would enable them to judge in some measure what grounds they had were hoping to succeed in separating the two friends. Heathcliff was hard to discover at first. If he were careless and uncared for, before Catherine's absence, he had been ten times more so since. Nobody but I even did him the kindness to call him a dirty boy and bid him wash himself once a week, and children of his age seldom have a natural pleasure in soap and water. Therefore, not to mention his clothes which had seen three months' service in mire and dust and his thick uncombed hair, the surface of his face and hands was dismally beclouded. He might well skulk behind the settle, on beholding such a bright, graceful damsel enter the house instead of a rough-headed counterpart to himself, as he expected. I know, you're so cute. Is Heathcliff not here? She demanded, pulling off her gloves and displaying fingers wonderfully whitened with doing nothing and staying indoors. Heathcliff, you may come forward, cried Mr. Hindley, enjoying his black, his... <sighs> I'm really struggling because I can't see the book. It's so dark in here. Um, you may come forward, blah, 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 enjoying his discomfiture and gratified to see what a forbidding young blackguard he would be compelled to present himself. You may come and wa wish Miss Catherine welcome like the other servants. Cathy, catching a glimpse of her friend in his concealment, flew to embrace him. She bestowed seven or eight kisses on his cheek within the second, and then stopped, and drawing back, burst into a laugh, exclaiming, Why, how very black and cross you look, and how funny and grim, but that's because I'm used to Edgar and Isabella Linton. Well, Heathcliff, have you forgotten me? She had some reason to put the question, for shame and pride threw double gloom over his countenance, and kept him immovable. Shake hands, Heathcliff, said Mr. Earnshaw, condescendingly. Once in a way, that is permitted. I shall not, replied the boy, finding his tongue at last. I shall not stand to be laughed at. I shall not bear it. 
and he would have broken from the circle, but Miss Cathy seized him again. I did not mean to laugh at you, she said. I could not hinder myself. Heathcliff, shake hands at least. What are you sulky for? It was only that you looked odd. If you wash your face and brush your hair, it will be all right, but you are so dirty. She gazed concernedly at the dusky fingers she held in her own, and also at her dress, which she feared had gained no embellishment from its contact with his. You needn't have touched me, he answered, following her eye and snatching away his hand. I shall be as dirty as I please, and I like to be dirty, and I will be dirty. With that he dashed head foremost out of the room, amid the merriment of the master and mistress, and to the serious disturbance of Catherine, who could not comprehend how her remarks should have produced such an exhibition of bad temper. After playing lady's maid to the newcomer, and putting my cakes in the oven, and making the house and kitchen cheerful with great fires befitting Christmas Eve, I prepared to sit down and amuse myself by singing carols all alone, regardless of Joseph's affirmations that he considered the merry tunes I chose as next door to songs. He had retired to private prayer in his chamber, and Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw were engaging Missy's attention by sundry gay trifles brought to her, brought for her to present to the little Lintons as an acknowledgment of their kindness. They had invited them to spend the morrow at Wuthering Heights, and the invitation had been accepted on one condition. Mrs. Linton begged that her darlings might be kept carefully apart from that naughty, swearing boy. Under these circumstances, I remained solitary. I smelt the rich scent of the heating spices, and admired the shining kitchen utensils, the polished clock, decked in holly, the silver mugs ranged on a tray ready to be filled with mulled ale for supper, and above all, the speckless purity of my particular care, the scoured and well-swept floor. I gave due inward applause to every object, and then I remembered how old Earnshaw used to come in when all was tidied, and call me a cant lass and slip a shilling into my hand as a Christmas box, and from that I went on to think of his fondness for Heathcliff, and his dread lest he should suffer neglect after death had removed him, and that naturally led me to consider the poor lad's situation now, and from singing I changed my mind to crying. It struck me soon, however, there would be more sense in endeavouring to repair some of his wrongs than shedding tears over them. I got up and walked into the court to seek him. Definitely not a pick-me-up, um, like Anne of Green Gables. It's been a long time since I read Wuthering Heights, but, um, I am just a huge fan of all the Brontes, so... Speaking of the Brontes, we have Jane Eyre. Now, I knew some of these books had Christmas scenes, and I really had to search for them, which was not always easy. All right. My first aim will be to clean down, do you comprehend the full force of the expression? To clean down Morehouse from chamber to cellar. My next to rub it up with beeswax, oil, and an indefinite number of cloths till it glitters again. My third to arrange every chair, table, bed, carpet with mathematical precision. Afterwards, I shall go near to ruin you in coals and peat to keep up good fires in every room. And lastly, the two days preceding that on which your sisters are expected will be devoted by Hannah and me to such a beating of eggs, sorting of currants, grating of spices, compounding of Christmas cakes, chopping up of materials for mince pies, and solemnizing of other culinary rites, as words can convey but an inadequate notion of to the uninitiated like you. My purpose, in short, is to have all things in an absolutely perfect state of readiness for Diana and Mary before next Thursday, and my ambition is to give them a beau ideal of welcome when they come. St. John smiled slightly. Still, he was dissatisfied. It is all very well for the present, said he, but seriously, I trust that when the first flush of vivacity is over, you will look a little higher than domestic endearments and household joys. The best things the world has, I interrupted. No, Jane, no, this world is not the scene of fruition. Do not attempt to make it so, nor of rest. Do not turn slothful. I mean, on the contrary, to be busy. Jane, I excuse you for the present. Two months' grace I allow you for the full enjoyment of your new position and for pleasing yourself with this late-found charm of relationship. But then, I hope you will begin to look beyond Morehouse and Morton and sisterly society and the selfish, calm, and sensual comfort of civilized affluence. I hope your energies will then once more trouble you with their strength. I looked at him with surprise. St. John, I said, I think you are almost wicked to talk so. I am disposed to be as content as a queen, and you try to stir me up to restlessness. To what end? To the end of turning to profit the talents which God has committed to your keeping, and of which he will surely one day demand a strict account. 
Jane, I shall watch you closely and anxiously. I warn you of that. <clears throat> and try to restrain the disproportionate fervor with which you throw yourself into commonplace home pleasures. Don't cling so tenaciously to ties of the flesh. Save your con constancy and ardor for an adequate cause. Forbear to waste them on trite, transient objects. Do you hear, Jane? Yes, just as if you were speaking Greek. I feel I have adequate cause to be happy. And I will be happy. Goodbye. I think I'll read the next paragraph. Happy at Morehouse I was, and hard I worked, and so did Hannah. She was charmed to see how jovial I could be amidst the bustle of a house turned topsy-turvy, how I could dust and brush and clean and cook, and really, after a day or two of confusion, worse confounded. It was delightful, by degrees, to invoke order from the chaos ourselves had made. I had previously taken a journey to... redacted... to purchase some new furniture my cousins having given me carte blanche to effect what alterations I pleased, and a sum having been set aside for that purpose. The ordinary sitting room and bedrooms I left much as they were, for I knew Diana and Mary would derive more pleasure from seeing again the old homely tables and chairs and beds than from the spectacle of the smartest innovations. Still some novelty was necessary to give to their return the piquancy with which I wished it to be invested. Dark, handsome new carpets and curtains, an arrangement of some carefully selected antique ornaments in porcelain and bronze, new coverings and mirrors and dressing cases for the toilet tables, answered the end. They looked fresh without being glaring. A spare parlor and bedroom I refurnished entirely, with old mahogany and crimson upholstery. I laid canvas on the passage and carpets on the stairs. When all was finished, I thought Morehouse as complete a model of bright, modest snugness within. As it was, at this season, a specimen of wintry waste and desert dreariness without. I think there's one more mention of Christmas. Oh yeah. It was Christmas week. We took to no settled employment, but spent it in a sort of merry domestic dissipation. The air of the moors, the freedom of home, the dawn of prosperity, acted on Diana and Mary's spirits like some life-giving elixir. They were gay from morning till noon and from noon till night. They could always talk and their discourse, witty, pithy, original, had such charms for me that I preferred listening to and sharing in it to doing anything else. St. John did not rebuke our vivacity, but he escaped from it. He was seldom in the house, his parish was large, the population scattered, and he found daily business in visiting the sick and poor in its different districts. I'll stop there. Man, I'll tell you, I love Victorian literature. It is hard to read out loud. Next up we have Little Women. And this chapter goes on and on, so I'm just going to read about the first page. The chapter's actually called A Merry Christmas. Joe was the first to wake in the grey dawn of Christmas morning. No stockings hung at the fireplace, and for a moment she felt as much disappointed as she did long ago, when her little sock fell down because it was so crammed with goodies. Then she remembered her mother's promise, and slipping her hand under a pillow, drew out a little crimson-covered book. She knew it very well, for it was that beautiful old story of the best life ever lived, and Jo felt that it was a true guidebook for any pilgrim going the long journey. She woke Meg with a Merry Christmas and bade her see what was under her pillow. A green-covered book appeared, with the same picture inside, and a few words written by their mother, which made their one present very precious in their eyes. Presently Beth and Amy woke to rummage and find their little books also, one dove-colored, the other blue, and all sat looking at and talking about them while the east grew rosy with the coming day. In spite of her small vanities, Margaret had a sweet and pious nature, which unconsciously influenced her sisters, especially Jo, who loved her very tenderly, and obeyed her because her advice was so gently given. Girls, said Meg seriously, looking from the tumbled head beside her to the two little nightcapped ones in the room beyond, Mother wants us to read and love and mind these books, and we must begin at once. We used to be faithful about it, but since father went away and all this war trouble unsettled us, we have neglected many things. You can do as you please, but I shall keep my book on the table here, and read a little every morning as soon as I wake, for I know it will do me good and help me through the day. Then she opened her new book and began to read. Jo put her arm round her, and leaning cheek to cheek, read also with the quiet expression so seldom seen on her restless face. How good Meg is. Come, Amy, let's do as they do. I'll help you with the hard words, and they'll explain things if we don't understand, whispered Beth, very much impressed by the pretty books and her sister's example. I'm glad mine is blue, said Amy, and then the rooms were very still while the pages were softly turned. 
and the winter sunshine crept in to touch the bright heads and serious faces with a Christmas greeting. We will stop there. What should we do next? Perhaps Wind in the Willows? I love this book so much. I say it every time. It's so wonderful. Gotta decide where to stop. And there's um quite a lot of coziness in this book and it like a lot of it feels like Christmas to me, but here specifically we have some Christmas carolers. And we're in Mole's house right now. It was a pretty sight and a seasonable one that met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of a horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle, red worsted comforters round their throats, their forepaws thrust deep into their pockets, their feet jigging for warmth. With bright beady eyes they glanced shyly at each other, sniggering a little, sniffing, and applying coat sleeves a good deal. As the door opened, one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying, Now then, one, two, three, and forthwith their shrill little voices uprose on the air, singing one of the old-time carols that their forefathers composed in fields that were fallow and held by frost, or when snowbound in chimney corners, and handed down to be sung in the miry street to lamp-lit windows at Yule time. And I'll read the carol, I'm not going to sing it. Villagers all, this frosty tide, let your doors swing open wide. Though wind may follow and snow beside, yet draw us in by your fire to bide, joy shall be yours in the morning. Here we stand in the cold and the sleet, Blowing fingers and stamping feet, come from far away, you to greet, you by the fire and we in the street, bidding you joy in the morning. For ere one half of the night was gone, sudden a star has led us on, raining bliss and venison, bliss tomorrow and more anon, joy for every morning. Goodman Joseph toiled through the snow, saw the star o'er a stable low, Mary she might not further go, welcome thatch and litter below, joy was hers in the morning. And then they heard the angels tell, who were the first to cry Noel, animals all as it befell in the stable where they did dwell. Joy shall be theirs in the morning. The voices ceased. The singers, bashful but smiling, exchanged sidelong glances, and silence succeeded, but for a moment only. Then from up above and far away, down the tunnel they had so lately traveled, was borne to the ears in a faint musical hum, the sound of distant bells ringing a joyful and clangorous peal. Very well sung, boys, cried the rat heartily, and now come along along in, all of you, and warm yourselves by the fire, and have something hot. Yes, come along, field mice, cried the mole eagerly. This is quite like old times. Shut the door after you. Pull up that settle to the fire. Now you just wait a minute while we... Oh, ready, he cried in despair, plumping down on a seat with tears impending. Whatever are we doing? We've nothing to give them. There's a nice picture. You leave all that to me, said the masterful rat. Here, you with the lantern. Come over this way. I want to talk to you. Now tell me, are there any shops open at this hour of the night? Why, certainly, sir, replied the field mouse respectfully. At this time of year, our shops keep open to all sorts of hours. Then look here, said the rat. You go off at once, you and your lantern, and you get me. Here much muttered conversation ensued, and the mole only heard bits of it, such as, Fresh, mind. No, a pound of that will do. See you get Bugginses, for I won't have any other. No, only the best. If you can't get it there, try somewhere else. Yes, of course, homemade. No tinned stuff. Well, then, do the best you can. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw. The field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases, and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice, perched in a row on the settle, their small legs swinging, gave themselves up to enjoyment of the fire, and toasted their chilblains till they tingled, while the mole, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history, and made each of them recite the names of his numerous brothers, who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to go out a-caroling this year, but looked forward very shortly to winning the parental consent. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label on one of the beer bottles. I perceive this to be old Burton, he remarked approvingly. Sensible mole, the very thing. Now we shall be able to mull some ale. Get the things ready, mole, while I draw the corks. It did not take long to prepare the brew and thrust the tin heater well into the red heart of the fire, and soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled ale goes a long way, and wiping his eyes and laughing and forgetting he had ever been cold in all his life. I think I'm going to stop there, but it's a very cute scene.
The whole book is so dang cute. Okay, we have four left. What should we do next? I have a little house on the prairie. And I have fond memories of this because my mom used to read it to me when I was a kid. And this is a whole chapter called Mr. Edwards Meets Santa Claus, so we're not going to read the entire thing because it's long. But let's take a look at it. The days were short and cold, the wind whistled sharply, but there was no snow. Cold rains were falling. Day after day the rain fell, pattering on the roof and pouring from the eaves. Mary and Laura stayed close by the fire, sewing their nine-patch quilt blocks or cutting paper dolls from scraps of wrapping paper and hearing the wet sound of the rain. Every night was so cold that they expected to see snow next morning, but in the morning they saw only sad, wet grass. They pressed their noses against the squares of glass in the windows that Pa had made, and they were glad they could see out, but they wished they could see snow. Laura was anxious because Christmas was near, and Santa Claus and his reindeer could not travel without snow. Mary was afraid that even if it snowed, Santa Claus could not find them, so far away in Indian territory. When they asked Ma about this, she said she didn't know. What day is it? They asked her anxiously. How many more days till Christmas? And they counted off the days on their fingers till there was only one more day left. Rain was still falling that morning. There was not one crack in the gray sky. They felt almost sure there would be no Christmas. Still, they just kept hoping. Just before noon, the light changed. The clouds broke and drifted apart, shining white in a clear blue sky. The sun shone, birds sang, and thousands of drops of water sparkled on the grasses. But when Ma opened the door to let in the fresh, cold air, they heard the creek roaring. They had not thought about the creek. Now they knew they would have no Christmas because Santa Claus could not cross that roaring creek. Pa came in bringing a big fat turkey. If it weighed less than 20 pounds, he said, he'd eat it feathers and all. He asked Laura, how's that for a Christmas dinner? Think you can manage one of those drumsticks? She said yes, she could, but she was sober. Then Mary asked him if the creek was going down, and he said it was still rising. Ma said it was too bad. She hated to think of Mr. Edwards eating his bachelor cooking all alone on Christmas Day. Mr. Edwards had been asked to eat Christmas dinner with them, but Pa shook his head and said a man would risk his neck trying to cross that creek now. No, he said, that current's too strong. We'll just have to make up our minds that Edwards won't be here tomorrow. Of course, that meant that Santa Claus could not come either. Laura and Mary tried not to mind too much. They watched Ma dress the wild turkey, and it was a very fat turkey. They were lucky little girls to have a good house to live in and a warm fire to sit by, and such a turkey for their Christmas dinner. Ma said so, and it was true. Ma said it was too bad that Santa Claus couldn't come this year, but they were such good girls that he hadn't forgotten them. He would surely come next year. Still, they were not happy. After summer supper that night, they washed their hands and faces, buttoned their red flannel nightgowns, tied their nightcap strings, and soberly said their prayers. They lay down in bed and pulled the covers up. It did not seem at all like Christmas time. Pa and Ma sat silent by the fire. After a while, Pa asked, Ma asked why Pa didn't play the fiddle, and he said, I don't seem to have the heart to, Caroline. After a longer while, Ma suddenly stood up. I'm going to hang up your stockings, girls, she said. Maybe something will happen. Laura's heart jumped, but then she thought again of the creek, and she knew nothing could happen. Ma took one of Mary's clean stockings and one of Laura's, and she hung them from the mantel shelf on either side of the fireplace. Laura and Mary watched her over the edge of their bed covers. Now go to sleep, Ma said, kissing them goodnight. Morning will come quicker if you're asleep. She sat down again by the fire, and Laura almost went to sleep. She woke up a little when she heard Pa say, You've only made it worse, Caroline. And she thought she heard Ma say, No, Charles, there's the white sugar. But perhaps she was dreaming. Then she heard Jack growl savagely. The door latch rattled, and someone said, Ingles, Ingles. Pa was stirring up the fire, and when he opened the door, Laura saw that it was morning. The outdoors was gray. Great fish hooks, Edwards. Come in, man. What's happened? Pa exclaimed. Laura saw the stockings limply dangling, and she scrooged her eyes, her shut eyes into the pillow. She heard Pa piling wood on the fire, and she heard Mr. Edwards say he had carried his clothes on his head when he swam the creek. His teeth rattled and his voice shivered. He would be all right, he said, as soon as he got warm. It was too big a risk, Edwards, Pa said. We're glad you're here, but that was too big a risk for a Christmas dinner. Your little ones had to have a Christmas, Mr. Edwards replied. No creek could stop me after I fetched them their gifts from Independence. Laura sat straight up in bed. Did you see Santa Claus? She shouted. I sure did, Mr. Edwards said. 
Where? When? What did he look like? What did he say? Did he really give you something for us? Mary and Laura cried. Wait, wait a minute, Mr. Edwards laughed. And Ma, Ma said she would put the presents in the stockings as Santa Claus intended. She said they mustn't look. Mr. Edwards came and sat on the floor by their bed, and he answered every question they asked him. They honestly tried not to look at Ma, and they didn't quite see what she was doing. When he saw the creek rising, Mr. Edwards said he had known that Santa Claus could not get across it. But you crossed it, Laura said. Yes, Mr. Edwards replied, but Santa Claus is too old and fat. He couldn't make it, where a long, lean razorback like me could do so. And Mr. Edwards reasoned that if Santa Claus couldn't cross the creek, likely he would come no farther south than Independence. Why should he come forty miles across the prairie, only to be turned back? Of course he wouldn't do that. So Mr. Edwards had walked to Independence. In the rain, Mary asked. Mr. Edwards said he wore his rubber coat. And there, coming down the street in Independence, he had met Santa Claus. In the daytime? Laura asked. She hadn't thought that anyone could see Santa Claus in the daytime. No, Mr. Edwards said. It was night, but light shone out across the street from the saloons. Well, the first thing Santa Claus said was, Hello, Edwards. Did he know you? Mary asked, and Laura asked, How did you know he was really Santa Claus? Mr. Edwards said that Santa Claus knew everybody, and he had recognized Santa at once by his whiskers. Santa Claus had the longest, thickest, whitest set of whiskers west of the Mississippi. So Santa Claus said, Hello, Edwards. Last time I saw you, you were sleeping on a corn shuck bed in Tennessee. And Mr. Edwards well remembered the little pair of red yarn mittens that Santa Claus had left for him that time. Then Santa Claus said, I understand you're living now down along the Verdigree River. Have you ever met up down yonder with two little young girls named Mary and Laura? I surely am acquainted with them, Mr. Edwards replied. It rests heavy on my mind, said Santa Claus. They are both of them sweet, sweet, pretty, good little things, and I know they are expecting me. I surely do hate to disappoint two good little girls like them. Yet with the water up the way it is, I can't ever make it across that creek. I can figure no way whatsoever to get to their cabin this year. Edwards, Santa Claus said, would you do me the favor to fetch them their gifts this one time? I'll do that, and with pleasure, Mr. Edwards told him. Then Santa Claus and Mr. Edwards stepped across the street to the hitching posts where the pack mule was tied. Didn't he have his reindeer? Laura asked. You know he couldn't, Mary said. There isn't any snow. Exactly, said Mr. Edwards. Santa Claus traveled with a pack mule in the southwest. And Santa Claus uncinched the pack and looked through it, and he took out the presents for Mary and Laura. Oh, what are they? Laura cried, but Mary asked, then what did he do? Then he shook hands with Mr. Edwards, and he swung up on his fine bay horse. Santa Claus rode well for a man of his weight and build, and he tucked his long white whiskers under his bandana. So long, Edwards, he said, and he rode away on the Fort Dodge Trail, leading his pack mule and whistling. Laura and Mary were silent an instant, thinking of that. Then Ma said, you may look now, girls. Something was shining bright in the top of Laura's stocking. She squealed and jumped out of bed. So did Mary, but Laura beat her to the fireplace. And the shining thing was a glittering new tin cup. Mary had one exactly like it. These new tin cups were their very own. Now they each had a cup to drink out of. Laura jumped up and down and shouted and laughed, but Mary stood still and looked with shining eyes at her own tin cup. Then they plunged their hands into the stockings again, and they pulled out two long, long sticks of candy. It was peppermint candy, striped red and white, they looked and looked at that beautiful candy, and Laura licked her stick just one lick, but Mary was not so greedy. She didn't take even one lick of her stick. Those stockings weren't empty yet. Mary and Laura pulled out two small packages. They unwrapped them and each found a little heart-shaped cake. Over their delicate, delicate brown tops was sprinkled white sugar. The sparkling grains lay like tiny drifts of snow. The cakes were too pretty to eat. Mary and Laura just looked at them. But at last, Laura turned hers over, and she nibbled a tiny nibble from underneath, where it wouldn't show. And the inside of that little cake was white. It had been made of pure white flour, and sweetened with white sugar. Laura and Mary never would have looked in their stockings again. The cups and the cakes and the candy were almost too much. They were too happy to speak. But Ma asked if they were sure the stockings were empty. Then they put their arms down inside them to make sure. And in the very toe of each stocking was a shining, bright new penny. They had never even thought of such a thing as having a penny. Think of having a whole penny for your very own. Think of having a cup and a cake and a stick of candy and a penny. There had never been such a Christmas. Now, of course, right away, Laura and Mary should have thanked Mr. Edwards for bringing those lovely presents all the way from Independence, but they had forgotten all about Mr. Edwards. They had even forgotten Santa Claus. In a minute, they would have remembered, but before they did, 
Ma said gently, aren't you going to thank Mr. Edwards? Oh, thank you, Mr. Edwards, thank you, they said, and they meant it with all their hearts. Pa shook Mr. Edwards' hand, too, and shook it again. Pa and Ma and Mr. Edwards acted as if they were almost crying. Laura didn't know why, so she gazed again at her beautiful presence. She looked up again when Ma gasped, and Mr. Edwards was taking sweet potatoes out of his pockets. He said they had helped to balance the package on his head when he swam across the creek. He thought Pa and Ma might like them with the Christmas turkey. There were nine sweet potatoes. Mr. Edwards had brought them all the way from town, too. It was just too much. Pa said so. It's too much, Edwards, he said. They never could thank him enough. Mary and Laura were too excited to eat breakfast. They drank the milk from their shining new cups, but they could not swallow the rabbit stew in the cornmeal mush. Don't make them, Charles, Ma said. It will soon be dinner time. For Christmas dinner, there was the tender, juicy, roasted turkey. There were the sweet potatoes baked in the ashes and carefully wiped so that you could eat the good skins, too. There was a loaf of salt-rising bread made from the last of the white flour. And after all that, there were stewed dried blackberries and little cakes. But these little cakes were made with brown sugar, and they did not have white sugar sprinkled over their tops. Then Pa and Ma and Mr. Edwards sat by the fire and talked about Christmas times back in Tennessee and up north in the big woods. But Mary and Laura looked at their beautiful cakes and played with their pennies and drank water out of their new cups. And little by little, they licked and sucked their sticks of candy till each stick was sharp pointed on one end. That was a happy Christmas. Well, oops, I read the whole chapter. It was just too cute. Whew, okay. Okay, we're getting slightly more modern here. We're going to do The Catcher in the Rye. I know, it doesn't feel like a warm, fuzzy Christmas book, does it? But we do have some mentions of Christmas, and I love this book. While I was walking, I passed these two guys that were unloading this big Christmas tree off a truck. One guy kept saying to the other guy, Hold the son of a bitch up! Hold it up, for Christ's sake! It certainly was a gorgeous way to talk about a Christmas tree. It was cer a sort of funny feeling, though. It was sort of funny, though. I can't read. In an awful way, and I started to sort of laugh. It was about the worst thing I could have done, because the minute I started to laugh, I thought I was going to vomit. I really did. I even started to, but it went away. I don't know why. I mean, I hadn't eaten anything unsanitary or like that. And usually I have quite a strong stomach. Anyway, I got over it. And I figured I'd feel better if I had something to eat. So I went in this very cheap-looking restaurant and had donuts and coffee. Only I didn't eat the donuts. I couldn't swallow them too well. The thing is, if you get very depressed about something, it's hard as hell to swallow. The waiter was very nice, though. He took them back without charging me. I just drank the coffee. And then I left and started walking over toward Fifth Avenue. It was Monday and all, and it was pretty near Christmas, and all the stores were open. So it wasn't too bad walking on Fifth Avenue. It was fairly Christmassy. All those scraggy-looking Santa Clauses were standing on corners ringing those bells, and the Salvation Army girls, the ones that don't wear any lipstick or anything, were ringing bells too. I sort of kept looking around for those two nuns I'd met at breakfast the day before, but I didn't see them. I knew I wouldn't, because they'd told me they'd come to New York to be school teachers. But I kept looking for them anyway. Anyway, it was pretty Christmassy all of a sudden. A million little kids were downtown with their mothers, getting on and off buses and coming in and out of stores. I wished old Phoebe was around. She's not little enough anymore to go stark staring mad in the toy department, but she enjoys horsing around and looking at the people. The Christmas before last, I took her downtown shopping with me. We had a hell of a time. I think it was in Bloomingdale's. We went in the shoe department and we pretended she, old Phoebe, wanted to get a pair of those very high storm shoes, the kind that have about a million holes to lace up. We had the poor salesman guy going crazy. Old Phoebe tried on about 20 pairs, and each time the poor guy had to lace one shoe all the way up. It was a dirty trick, but it killed old Phoebe. We finally bought a pair of moccasins and charged them. The salesman was very nice about it. I think he knew we were horsing around, because old Phoebe always starts giggling. Anyway, I kept walking and walking up Fifth Avenue, without any tie on or anything. Then all of a sudden, something very spooky started happening. Every time I came to the end of the block and stepped off the goddamn curb, I had this feeling that I'd never get to the other side of the street. I thought I'd just go down, 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 and nobody'd ever see me again. Boy, did it scare me. You can't imagine. I started sweating like a bastard, my whole shirt and underwear and everything. Then I started doing something else. Every time I'd get to the end of a block, I'd make believe I was talking to my brother, Allie. I'd say to him, Allie, don't let me disappear. Allie, don't let me disappear. Allie, don't let me disappear. Please, Allie. And then, when I'd reach the other side of the street without disappearing, I'd thank him. Then it would start all over again as soon as I got to the next corner. 
but I kept going and all. I was sort of afraid to stop, I think. I don't remember to tell you the truth. I don't... I know I didn't stop till I was way up in the 60s, past the zoo and all. Then I sat down on this bench. I could hardly get my breath, and I was still sweating like a bastard. I sat there, I guess, for about an hour. Finally, what I decided I'd do, I decided I'd go away. I decided I'd never go home again, and I'd never go away to another school again. I decided I'd just see old Phoebe and sort of say goodbye to her and, and all and give her back her Christmas dough, and then I'd start hitchhiking my way out west. No, stop there. It's a sad book. Um, but I relate so much to it, and also that brings us to the next one, which is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And this is kind of thought of as a modern day catcher in the rye. It's really sad, so we're just gonna pull out a couple of little passages here. December 23rd, 1991. Dear friend, Sam and Patrick left with their family for the Grand Canyon yesterday. I don't feel too bad about it because I can still remember Sam's kiss. It feels peaceful and right. I even considered not washing my lips like they do on TV, but then I thought it would get too gross. So instead I spent today walking around the neighborhood. I even got out my old sled and my old scarf. There is something cozy about that for me. I walked over to the little hill where we used to go and sled. There were a lot of little kids there. I watched them flying, doing jumps and having races, and I thought that all those little kids are going to grow up someday, and all of those little kids are going to do the things that we do, and they will all kiss someone someday, but for now, sledding is enough. I think it would be great if sledding were always enough, but it isn't. Skip ahead. Tomorrow I'm going with my mom to buy presents for everyone, and then we are celebrating my birthday. I was born on December 24th. I don't know if I ever told you that. It's a strange birthday to have because it is so close to Christmas. After that, we are celebrating Christmas with my dad's family, and my brother will be home for a little while. Then I'm going to going out to take my driver's test, so I will be busy while Sam and Patrick are gone. Tonight I watched some television with my sister, but she didn't want to watch the Christmas specials that were on, so I decided to go upstairs and read. Bill gave me one book to read over the break. It's The Catcher in the Rye. It was Bill's favorite book when he was my age. He said it was the kind of book you made your own. I read the first 20 pages. I don't know how I feel about it just yet, but it does seem appropriate to this time. I hope Sam and Patrick call on my birthday. It would make me feel much better. And then one more little, little bit. Then we went outside to put up Luminaria, which is an activity where all our neighbors fill brown paper bags with sand and line the street with them. Then we stick a candle in the sand of each bag, and when we light the candles, it turns the street into a landing strip for Santa Claus. I love putting Luminaria up every year because it is very beautiful, and a tradition, and a good distraction for my birthday. My family gave me some really nice birthday presents. My sister was still mad at me, but she got me a Smith's record anyway, and my brother got me a poster signed by the whole football team. My dad gave me some records that my sister told him to buy, and my mom gave me some of the books she loved when she was a kid. One of them was The Catcher in the Rye. There you go, we get two references to it right there. Now I'm going to finish on probably a happier note with Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. I feel like there's a Christmas scene in every Harry Potter book. I could be wrong, but because it, Christmas always happens and we have to, like, we see Harry at the castle not going home because he doesn't want to be with the Dursleys, um, or we see him spending it with Ron in the burrow, it just, th these books always feel like Christmas books to me. Um, and of course, I want to take a look at the chapter, the Yule Ball. So let's pull some things out of here. Despite the very heavy load of homework that the fourth years had been given for the holidays, Harry was in no mood to work when term ended and spent the week leading up to Christmas enjoying himself as fully as possible along with everyone else. Gryffindor Tower was hardly less crowded now than during term time. It seemed to have shrunk slightly too, as its inhabitants were being so much rowdier than usual. Fred and George had had a great success with their canary creams, and for the first couple of days of the holidays, people kept bursting into feather all over the place. Before long, however, all the Gryffindors had learned to treat food anybody else offered them with extreme caution, in case it had a canary cream concealed in the center. And George confided to Harry that he and Fred were now working on developing something else. Harry made a mental note never to accept so much as a crisp from Fred or Fred and George in future. 
He still hadn't forgotten Dudley and the ton tung toffee. Snow was falling thickly upon the castle and its grounds now. The pale blue Bobaton carriage looked like a large, chilly, frosted pumpkin next to the iced gingerbread house that was Hagrid's cabin. While the Durmstrang ship's portholes were glazed with ice, the rigging white with frost, the house elves down in the kitchen were outdoing themselves with a series of rich, warming stews and savory puddings, and only Fleur Delacour seemed to be able to find anything to complain about. <clears throat> and then we'll skip ahead to Christmas. Harry awoke very suddenly on Christmas Day. Wondering what had caused his abrupt return to consciousness, he opened his eyes and saw something with very large, round, green eyes staring back at him in the darkness, so close they were almost nose to nose. Dobby, Harry yelled, scrambling away from the elf so fast he almost fell out of bed. Don't do that. Dobby is sorry, sir, squeaked Dobby anxiously, jumping backward with his long fingers over his mouth. Dobby is only wanting to wish Harry Potter Merry Christmas and bring him a present, sir. Harry Potter did say Dobby could come and see him sometimes, sir. It's okay, said Harry, still breathing rather faster than usual, while his heart rate returned to normal. Just, just prod me or something in future, all right? Don't bend over me like that. Harry pulled back the curtains around his four-poster, took his glasses from his bedside table, and put them on. His yell had awoken Ron, Seamus, Dean, and Neville. All of them were peering through the gaps in their own hangings, heavy-eyed and tussle-haired. Someone attacking you, Harry? Seamus asked sleepily. No, it's just Dobby, Harry muttered. Go back to sleep. Nah, presents, said Seamus, spotting the large pile at the foot of his bed. Ron, Dean, and Neville decided that now, now they were awake, they might as well get down to some present opening, too. Harry turned back to Dobby, who was now standing nervously next to Harry's bed, still looking worried that he had upset Harry. There was a Christmas bauble tied to the loop on top of his tea cozy. Can Dobby give Harry Potter his present? He squeaked tentatively. Of course you can, said Harry. Or I've got something for you, too. It was a lie. He hadn't bought anything for Dobby at all. But he quickly opened his trunk and pulled out a particularly knobbly, rolled-up pair of socks. They were his oldest and foulest, mustard yellow, and had once belonged to Uncle Vernon. The reason they were extra knobbly was that Harry had been using them to cushion his sneakoscope for over a year now. He pulled out the sneakoscope and handed the socks to Dobby, saying, Sorry, I forgot to wrap them. But Dobby was utterly delighted. Socks are Dobby's favorite, favorite clothes, sir, he said, ripping off his odd ones and pulling on Uncle Vernon's. I have seven now, sir. But sir, he said, his eyes widening, having pulled both socks up to their highest extent so that they reached to the bottoms of his shorts. They has made a mistake in the shop, Harry Potter. They is giving you two the same. Ah, uh, no, Harry, how come you didn't spot that, said Ron, grinning over from his own bed, which was now strewn with wrapping paper. Tell you what, Dobby, here you go. Take these two and you can mix them up properly. And here's your sweater. He threw Dobby a pair of violet socks he had just unwrapped and the hand-knitted sweater Mrs. Weasley had sent. Dobby looked quite overwhelmed. Sir is very kind, he squeaked, his eyes brimming with tears again, bowing deeply to Ron. Dobby knew Sir must be a great wizard, for he is Harry Potter's greatest friend, but Dobby did not know that he was also as generous of spirit, as noble, as selfless. They're only socks, said Ron, who had gone slightly pink around the ears, though he looked rather pleased all the same. Wow, Harry. He had just opened Harry's present, a Chudley cannon hat. Cool. He jammed it onto his head where it clashed horribly with his hair. Dobby now handed Harry a small package, which turned out to be socks. Dobby is making them himself, sir, the elf said happily. He is buying the wool out of his wages, sir. The left sock was bright red and had a pattern of broomsticks upon it. The right sock was green with a pattern of snitches. They're, they're really... Well, thanks, Dobby, said Harry, and he pulled them on, causing Dobby's eyes to leak with happiness again. Dobby must go now, sir. We is already making Christmas dinner in the kitchens, said Dobby, and he hurried out of the dormitory, waving goodbye to Ron and the others as he passed. Harry's other presents were much more satisfactory than Dobby's odd socks, with the obvious exception of the Dursleys, which consisted of a single tissue, an all-time low. Harry supposed they were too, they too were remembering the ton tongue toffee. Hermione had given Harry a book called Quidditch Teams of Britain and Ireland, Ron a bulging bag of dung bombs, Sirius a handy penknife with attachments to unlock any lock and undo any knot, and Hagrid a vast box of sweets including all Harry's favorites, Bertie Bott's Every Flavor Beans, Chocolate Frogs, Drupal's Best Blowing Gum, and Fizzing Whisbees. There was also, of course, Mrs. Weasley's usual package, including a new sweater, green with a picture of a dragon on it. Harry supposed Charlie had told her, all about the horn tail, and a large quantity of homemade mince pies. Harry and Ron went 
met up with Hermione in the common room, and they went down to breakfast together. They spent most of the morning in Gryffindor Tower, where everyone was enjoying their presence, then returned to the Great Hall for a magnificent lunch, which included at least a hundred turkeys, and Christmas puddings, and large piles of cribbage's wizarding crackers. They went out onto the grounds in the afternoon. The snow was untouched except for the deep channels made by the Durmstrang and Bobaton students on their way up to the castle. Hermione chose to watch Harry and the Weasley snowball fight rather than join in, and at five o'clock she was going back upstairs to get ready for the ball. "'What, you need three hours?' said Ron, looking at her incredulously and paying for his lapse in concentration, when a large snowball thrown by George hit him hard on the side of the head. "'Who are you going with?' he yelled after Hermione, but she just waved and disappeared up the stone steps into the castle. There was no Christmas tea today as the ball included a feast, so at seven o'clock, when it had become hard to aim properly, the others abandoned their snowball fight and trooped back to the common room. The fat lady was sitting in her frame, with her friend Violet from downstairs, both of them extremely tipsy, empty boxes of chocolate liqueurs littering the bottom of her picture. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, but this makes me want to go and watch the whole Yule Ball scene. It's so beautiful in the movie. Okay, that was a lot of reading. I hope you enjoyed that, even moderately. Um, and let me know, what is your favorite Christmas book or Christmas scene? Do you think of a book as a Christmas book, if there is one Christmas scene. Like, there's the whole argument about, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? And I kind of think, yeah, like, you can definitely categorize something as a Christmas book or movie, if there's, like, a little mention of it. Um, and again, as I said, with the cozy books, anything that makes you feel warm and jolly and good, that's, that's a Christmas vibe. That's a cozy vibe. So, Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you for watching, and until I see you next time, happy reading.